What's the most common mistake a new paranormal investigator makes? Watching TV. <laughs> okay, how so? All the paranormal shows on TV, um, there, there's one exception to this that I've seen, but all of them are complete crap. They all use confirmation bias all the way through. What's uh, the exception? The exception is National Geographic's Is It Real? And if you've got Netflix, go back and watch it. I think, I, I think quite seven often... Seven people on that one. I think quite often they don't realize what they don't know. They go in, they say, oh, I'm a skeptic, I've read some books, uh, you know, I've read Randy's books, and now I can be an investigator. And uh, they also don't go in with a little bit of an open mind. Um, and they basically what they're doing is they're doing exactly what the scientists did with me. They're going in with their own bias, and they don't know how to step away from that bias and really do proper investigation. Mm -hmm. In my experience, uh, the, the biggest problem that I, well, there, there's a handful of them, but one of the biggest ones is a lack of, of research. Uh, they, they, they just jump into cases cold and, you know, for example, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see ghost hunters or ghost investigators who will, they'll, they'll go into a supposedly haunted location and they'll immediately turn off all the lights, which is weird to me. And then, then they'll walk around with, with cameras and, and they'll be hunting for ghosts. And I'll try to explain, well, what is the claim? You have to establish the claim. What, what, is, what, is, what is supposed to be happening here? And they'll completely forget that. They'll be like, oh, there's a claim? It's like, yeah, that's what you're supposed to be doing instead of wandering around the place in the dark. And so they, 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 they don't do the research, they don't do the background uh, work on it, and so then they just sort of you know, end up with this sort of weird non-investigation investigation. Well, now, Ben has just made very uh, evident uh, the thing that I so admire about his approach, that is, prepare yourself. Uh, ask the questions in advance and determine what's going to happen and ask them to decide what the claim is that they're actually uh, pursuing or investigating. So uh, I congratulate you for that, Ben, as I have before. But uh, my concern with this matter is the media itself. In general, the media doesn't give a damn whether what they uh, present via television, in books, uh, in radio, in any way, and in public meetings. They don't really care whether what they're presenting has any truth behind it or not, just as long as it sells sponsors' goods. The bottom line is, will the sponsors be happy with it? And the sponsors will be happy if lots of people are tuned in. Lots of people are exposed to it in the magazines or newspapers or on television or radio. That's all the sponsor cares. They want their product to be named and they want a lot of people to receive that name all at the same time. The media doesn't give a damn. And you've got to remember that. They're not gonna be on your side if you're not gonna offer them uh, something in that direction, something that they can use commercially. So beware of the media. Uh, their honesty is always uh, to be questioned, to be doubted, not uh, condemned and not uh, refused if it's offered. But be very careful of Greeks bearing gifts, as they say. So that, uh, that say they're going to apply and that, that it always starts out, I'm a skeptic, but I yeah. have this power. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the problem is that the, even, if you, even if you go into investigation and say, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptic, that means nothing. For example, the ghost hunter guys, the plumbers, they call themselves skeptics. Make yeah. of that what you will. Yeah, exactly. Well, they are. They're also frauds. <laughs> <laughs> they know, yeah, I said it, sue me. Um, because we got proof that they are. Uh, now the thing is, is that they, they actually don't believe a damn thing they see on that show because they admit, they've admitted to us, Brian and I, the, the times when they have cheated. They know there's no ghosts out there, but they know damn well what sells to the advertisers too, or for the advertisers. So they're skeptics, sure, they're telling the truth there. Unfortunately. There you go. Um, so these ghost hunters that we see on TV, are they doing paranormal investigations or is it a misnomer? Briefly, no. <laughs> Most of them. No, most of those shows are scripted anyway. And I, I can tell you right now, a really easy way to see if a show is scripted, turn off the volume and just watch it. And you'll be amazed how quickly you can spot that it's all just acting. Uh, you can also see a lot of them have disclaimers at the end of the show. 
and often they are called a docu-soap, which means we read from a script. Um, so no, they're not actually doing anything. Now, the TV-trained ghost hunter that tries to go out and emulate those shows, um, well, we're, we're talking about the, the, the flexibility of language. Uh, to them, what they're doing is paranormal investigation. Uh, but to them, a skeptic means non-believer cynic. Uh, to us, that's not paranormal investigation, and skeptic means open-minded and willing to find the truth and doesn't take things at face value. So we're almost not speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add that, that yeah, they're, they're not doing investigation, they're not sort of doing sort of investigation that I would recognize as investigation, primarily because investigation, it means to investigate. It means to try and get to the, get to the bottom of or answer a question of. Sometimes this is not what they're doing. yourself to the point of wetting your pants is investigation. What was that? What was that? Oh my God! Oh my God! That's not investigation. It's uh, it's you know, it's it's you know, 52 minutes of mildly entertaining television in some cases. But you know, the the, the purpose of, of of the actors or participants or whatever you want to call them, the purpose of the show is not to seek the truth. These are not. This is not a documentary. This is not someone trying to solve a mystery. These are people trying to fill. Uh, fill an hour of, of entertainment. That's all they're doing. And those disclaimers that scroll up and up and down the screen so fast at the end, if you slow it down, uh, if you've got a, a TiVo a facility in your TV, slow it down and read what they say there. They go so fast that you can't read them. The disclaimers are so comprehensive. They disclaim everything. They take no responsibility for anything whatsoever. Uh, they end up pretty well saying, uh, none of this should be construed as being true. And th that's what it sums up to when you come right down to it. For entertainment purposes only. Yes, exactly. I think it proves the point. You've got to be very careful uh, in accepting and or rejecting something from, particularly from young folks, who often uh, are making mistakes. They don't understand quite how their own minds work and how their evidence gathering uh, ability might be a little immature. I'm going to give you an example of a member of my family, frankly, the only member of my family that I really, really got along with was my paternal grandfather, George. Oh, wonderful gentleman who had been born in Austria. His family moved to uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, and became Danish citizens. Now, many years ago, I had the opportunity of uh, visiting, uh, well, I visited Copenhagen, and I've worked in Copenhagen many times over the years, but I had a chance to visit there with some skeptics who facilitated some things for me, and I found out a great deal about old George. Now, George had, was very, very fond of telling a story about the fact that as a youth living in Copenhagen, he was an only child, and he lived uh, on a street which was quite adjacent to the royal palace. And the royal palace is quite easily available uh, that is, the grounds outside the palace are quite easily available to pedestrians and they can walk through them. And uh, it, so it's a, it's a very good democracy in that respect. And uh, little George, uh, he had the job of delivering his lunch to his father. Now his father, my great-grandfather, obviously, uh, he worked in the shipyards, which were on the other side of the royal palace, down on, uh, on the shore, of course. And uh, he didn't, he left at very, very early hour of the morning, like 5.30 in the morning or so to get to work. And uh, he didn't have time for his wife to get up and bake the lunch for him. And so it would be put in a, in a, in a paper wrapping and it would be left for little George. When he left for school, he had the job of delivering this to the shipyards and putting it in the hands of his father. Then he would proceed on to school. Now, I had the opportunity of walking along the path that little George used to take many years ago. That's quite an experience, believe me. And um, little George developed a, a, a phantom companion, a, a mysterious character that she, he said that he knew. Uh, you know how children invent these things, the, the phantom, the ghost, of, ghost companion, the phantom friend. And uh, so he developed this story, and he would delight in telling his uh, family, his, his parents, when he got home, uh, what Mr. Christian had told him. And uh, Mr. Christian, it, uh, it turned out, uh, was a man who rode a great big black horse, a monstrous black horse, and he had uh, people all around him with sabers and such. Oh, how exciting. And uh, dogs that were bigger than he himself, little George, was. 
And uh, this was a great fantasy story, a fantasy companion. And the, the parents would sort of listen and say, yes, George, okay, George. <laughs> great, George, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you, George, eat your dinner. Uh, that kind of thing. They didn't pay much attention to it, but they thought it was an innocent aberration of a child. And uh, so the father sat George down one day. And I'm, by the way, I should add that, that Mr. Christian actually passed messages on to the family. There's such things as uh, he knew Mr. Christian. Apparently he knew that George's father lived in the shipyards. And at one point he gave him some advice saying that uh, the shipyards are going to be moved and that his father should uh, think carefully about whether he wanted to keep his position there. And uh, so he brought this message home. The father said, yeah, yeah, sure, George. Okay, eat your supper. Uh, the same thing. And uh, so uh, one day his father sat him down and said, now, George, you're 13 years of age now, and this is ridiculous, having a fantasy companion like this, and people are beginning to talk. They think you're a little, little nuts. And he said, oh, but it's real, Daddy. You know, it is real. No, 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 George. I don't want to listen to, we don't want to hear the name of Mr. Christian again, please. I don't want to hear a word about it, okay? Your mother and I are sick and tired of this. Now you've got to grow up, and you've got to drop this fantasy companion. And little George glumly agreed that that was the father's command. Well, uh, a year or so after that, his father one evening unfurled the newspaper at home, and little George looked up in great surprise and pointed to the front page. And the father said, what's up? He said, that's Mr. Christian. He looked at the front page. It was the birthday of King Christian X of Denmark. <laughs> And the people standing around ahead the sword, so there were great wolfhounds standing beside him. It turned out that my grandfather had been telling the truth all the way along. That was not a fantasy companion. He was talking every morning on his way through the castle courtyard to the shipyard. He would meet the king doing his morning uh, journey around the courtyard <laughs> to, uh, to, to visit some of the, the, the people, the citizens who had petitions to give him, you see. George had been telling the truth. He had been talking with Christian X of Denmark, the king of Denmark of the whole damn country, every morning of his life when he went to school. He was telling the truth, and he, he, he told me that his father's attitude improved radically. After that. <laughs> I thought I would share that with you because sometimes the kids are right. They aren't having fantasy companions, and they aren't making up stories. Sometimes there can be some truth at the base of it, so beware. <laughs>